Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Women's Suffrage Movement in the United States, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the Florida Virtual Schools Teaching American History Project and America in Class from the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm, Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating the session this morning. Now, I'm going to dispense with the even brief uh, uh, introduction that I normally do with our Florida Virtual School seminars. You folks know the drill. We've got a lot of material to cover, so let's get right underway and move straight to the goals for our seminar this morning. We hope to demonstrate that the franchise was not just given to women when the 19th, century, 19th Amendment was ratified. Rather, it required the work of generations of suffragists who labored long and hard to win it. And our second goal, as always, to provide fresh instructional material and approaches for use with students. We had a good discussion of this topic on the forum. You posed a number of really uh, interesting uh, and insightful questions. Why were women denied the right to vote? What initially prompted women to seek the vote? How active were married women in the women's suffrage movement? How did the struggle to win the vote for women relate to the same struggle on behalf of African Americans? Was the women's suffrage movement mainly a rural or an urban phenomenon in its origin? Was the movement largely the work of affluent women or working class women much involved? What role did gender stereotypes play in the movement? What arguments did women make in favor of suffrage? And finally, how did men respond to the women's suffrage movement? Did they dismiss it as a bunch of garden parties? Were they hostile to it? Did many men support it? To lead us through those questions this morning, we're very pleased to have with us Marjorie J. Spruill, a professor of history at the University of South Carolina, and this year a resident associate at the National Humanities Center. While she's here, Marjorie is working on a book that will look at women's rights, family values, and the polarization of American politics. In 1993, she published New Women of the New South, the Leaders of the Women's Suffrage Movement in the Southern States. So let me turn the program over to Marjorie. Let me just find her name right here and make Marjorie the presenter. Okay, Marjorie, the board is yours. Tell us about the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Well, good morning, Richard, and good morning, everyone down there in Florida. I am going to be talking with you about what is one of my favorite historical subjects, the women's suffrage movement in America. And based on having written about it a lot and taught about it quite a few times, I'm going to be sharing with you what I think are some of the most interesting aspects and themes, as well as documents, and I hope that it's going to be useful to you in teaching this to your students. It sounds like from the questions you raised and the things I was planning to talk about, we are right on target. We're going to start by investigating very quickly why a suffrage movement was necessary, why women couldn't vote from the beginning of our nation's history, which I remember really surprised me very much when I first found this out as a child, that there was a time when we women did not have that right. And then we will be discussing how the movement began, and then for the rest of our time together, how the movement changed over time in response to changes in American society and politics. We are also going to identify some of the most important leaders, several generations of really interesting people, in fact, and learn about the supportive relationships as well as the tension that developed among them as they tried to figure out the best strategies to attain what was a mutual goal. We're also going to learn about the growing diversity among the constituency or the supporters of women's suffrage in terms of region, religion, race, class, ethnicity, and even attitude. We will see that the story included both some very inspiring stories of cooperation among suffragists, and by the way, suffragists uh, could be women or men and were. So among suffragists who were women and men who were black and white, but along with this cooperation, there were also times of tension and real disappointment, even betrayal. The suffragists shared a lot of the limitations and the prejudices that were widespread in their era, and they had to contend also with the prejudices of the people they were trying to persuade. 
and as a result, sometimes they adopted strategies that seemed to betray the ideals of the movement in order to get the right to vote. And as we're going to see, ultimately, women suffrage leaders decided that they had to focus on suffrage and suffrage alone in order for women to be able to, by voting, help themselves and help others. So let's begin, let's see, advancing this to the next. Okay, we see here on the screen a legal concept of them covert, sometimes referred to as coverture. Um, again, we are part of our goal is to understand the reasons that some men and women oppose women's suffrage and how despite a lot of obstacles, suffragists finally succeeded in gaining a federal suffrage amendment that enfranchised women in every state. Um, so this is really where we start, is this question. In the beginning of our national history, why did women not have the right to vote to begin with? And at the root of the problem was this legal concept that was part of our colonial heritage, part of the English common law that was then adopted by each of the states and by the nation. Um, so you see here, film covert, it's this legal doctrine under which a husband and wife were considered one person, and that person was the husband. Uh, according to this doctrine, their interest and identities merged at the time of, of marriage, but the, but the legal identity, the political identity was that of the husband. Married women were not even able to own property, sign legal documents, or enter into a contract. Uh, they could not even gain an education without the husband's uh, approval. If they did any wages outside of the home, those wages belonged to the husband. And as far as the vote, since at the time the United States became a nation, there were property requirements for voting, and women couldn't own property. This left women out. Like other dependent persons, women were not assumed to have a sep have separate interests of their own that needed to be represented in politics. So that is, as you're talking to this to your students about this, you're basically trying to let them know that at the time the nation was founded, the U.S. was not really what we think of as a democracy in which every citizen voted and represented himself or herself. It was a republic, which meant that people elected representatives, but only free men who owned property were considered to have this stake in society and be allowed to elect representatives who would then make the laws for all. Okay. Um, Marjorie, I have a question mm -hmm. before we move on. What about yeah. widows and single women? Um, well, suffragists would never tire of pointing out that that is a very good contradiction to think about. And interestingly, in there was a brief period in New Jersey where single women were voting, and uh, but they they put an end to that. Generally speaking, this was one of those um, contradictions that were widely ignored. Uh, again, suffragists would bring it up later on, uh, pointing out that, um, that single women could own property, widows did own property, but that didn't change a thing when it came to them being able to vote. Okay, so we could say then that despite their status, despite their marital status, under coverture, women were politically and legally invisible. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. It, and um, it, it, in the, and again, that this gets down to the issue of individuality, of, of having it assumed that you have some some uh, individual interest that you that must be represented by you and you alone. They didn't look at it that way because the assumption was that the husband, as head of the household, spoke for the whole household, and he had the controlling voice within that household, and that there was no need for a woman to thus uh, have a separate vote. She okay. just didn't. 
Mm-hmm. We, have, we have another question that will actually set us up for the next uh, next portion of our presentation. What about the wives of politicians? Were they overlooked and silent? Shall we move on to John Adams and Abigail? <laughs> yes, let's do that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Diana, for setting that up. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, this issue was raised early on by uh, one of the most impressive women in American history to one of the most impressive men, her husband, looking at Abigail Adams, who became later the first lady, and then years later, the mother of a president, John Quincy Adams. And uh, actually, what she's raising is an issue that suffragists were constantly going to be having to deal with later, and that is, uh, what do you do when people are saying that women don't need the right to vote because not because they don't have other interests to represent, but that they really had so much influence already, that they were the real powers behind the throne, as you as you will. Um, in this famous exchange of letters, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, John, who was then a member of Continental Congress, and in the process with others of establishing the laws for a new nation. And, uh, Tell you what, let me read her part, and then Richard, you can read uh, John's part, and then we will discuss this. Okay. Okay, so on March 31st, 1776, Abigail writes to John, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husband. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That your sex are naturally tyrannical is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute. But such of you as wish to be happy, willingly give up this harsh tide of master for the more tender and enduring one of friend. Why then not put it out of the power of the vicious and the lawless to use us with cruelty and indignity, with impunity? Men of sense in all ages abhor those customs which treat us only as the servants of your sex. Regard us, then, as being placed by providence under your protection and an imitation of the supreme being. Make use of that power only for our happiness. Okay, if we could go on to John's part. Marjorie, could you advance the slide? Uh, Yes. Okay, now people say I sound remarkably like John Adams. <laughs> As to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosed the bonds of government everywhere, that children and apprentices were disobedient, that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent to their masters. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. This is rather too coarse a compliment, but you are so saucy, I won't blot it out. Depend upon it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We dare not exert our power in its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly, and in practice, you know we are the subjects. We have only the name of masters rather than give up this which would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat. I hope General Washington and all our brave heroes would fight. So let's discuss this. What do you think? Um, Is Abigail Adams actually asking for women to have the vote? And, And if not, what is her concern? What is she asking for? Okay. And Jennifer writes, it's a flirty way to keep his stance. <laughs> yeah, John, he's, he's bending over backwards here to be uh, discreet and flirty. And, uh, you know, I would also say condescending. But what is she asking for here? We have a question on the table. Let's hear some comments here. Okay. Um, 
I would say that uh, while we're waiting for our participants, ah, okay, I think she is asking for them to be outwardly considerate of Will's views. Yes. Is she asking uh, for the vote here, do you think? Uh, she is asking for the right to be equal. Ah, yes. Good. Okay. Regard us as placed by providence under your protection. Yeah. Okay. But is, any, is, any other comments? Is she willing just to rely totally on their goodwill and inclination? Ah, there you go. <clears throat> is she asking? No, she's not. She yeah, she is asking for a change, even though she's not yet coming out and asking for the vote per se. What is she asking them to do? Okay, she is saying that when men who have given respect in this area are the ones with sense, she points to the true biblical interpretation. Okay, using providence as her citing. Yeah. Okay, so it, it would seem, uh, Marjorie, that she's asking for uh, some, as Laura writes here, uh, some protection and some means of respect that go merely beyond the goodwill of men. She's asking perhaps for some codified protection, some codified statements of equality. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Well, if if you look back to that that sentence where she says, "Why not put it out of the power of the vicious and the lawless to use us with cruelty and indignity and meaning and get away with it?" So, in other words, they, they have a great marriage. They are uh, the beginning of what people call the companionate marriage. Um, and so, she, obviously, she is not in an abusive marriage. But what she is pointing out to him is. You know, men like you, good men, uh, why do you, in the laws you adopt, leave it in the hands of bad men, the power to be abusive to their wives? So why can't men like you protect us by taking the power to use us with impunity any way they want to take that away from men, other men, or in men in general? Does that make sense? I think so. I think so. Shall we move on then? Okay. And she is also suggesting that this idea of only relying on indirect influence on uh, a, an individual woman's ability to talk her in her husband into things it is not always wholly satisfactory when the man's not a good, kind man in the uh, in the first place. And he, of course, is saying, oh, hey, you don't need this because, you know, you can talk us into anything you want anyway, and we are really the subjects rather than the masters. <laughs> we have an interesting comment here. If this was an email, there'd be lots of smiley faces so that it would not be taken the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to see what the emails among the founding fathers would have been like. Okay, Marjorie, shall we move ahead then? Yes. My screen just, okay. So, uh, as the years went by, state governments began expanding the electorate, dropping a lot of these property requirements for voting, and allowing, by the time of the Civil War, all white men, regardless of whether they owned any property or not, to vote. So, this led a small but determined number of women to ask why it was that as America became increasingly democratic, Women, who were widely spoken of at the time as more religious and more moral than men, were still being denied the full rights of citizenship. And they started pressing for the vote, as well as many other improvements in women's legal, social, and political status. In terms of region, the women's suffrage movement began in the northeastern part of the United States. And it starts during an era of reform immediately preceding the Civil War. It was a major impetus to it was this period of religious revival called the Second Great Awakening. And it stimulated this upsurge of reform efforts, including the anti slavery movement. Now, a number of reformers, including Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a woman you see here on the screen, began to speak out for women's rights when their efforts to participate equally with men in reform movements were rebuffed by most of the male reformers. 
In fact, it is interesting to note that many of the abolitionists who were presumably the most uh, advanced thinkers of their day when it came to social issues, nevertheless insisted that women should not speak in public or take on leadership roles even in moral reform movements. This exchange of letters that you see here between another famous couple, um, an exchange that came at the very outset of their relationship before they had even met, is a good illustration of this problem, this issue, that women who wish to participate in reform movements ran into problems. Interestingly, after male reformers, many of the ministers insisted that these women remain silent. Many of the women working against slavery discovered a need to speak out not only for the rights of slaves, but for women's rights. So who are these people? We're about to take a look at these letters. This is Theodore Weld writing uh, to the Grimke sisters, in particular to Angelina Grimke. These were some of the most amazing characters, I think, in American history. Really fascinating. These were two sisters from a distinguished family of Charleston, South Carolina. They were two of the 14 children in this family that owned many slaves. And one of the most amazing twists in the history of the anti-slavery movement and women's history was that the two of them, for various reasons I could go into but can't for lack of time, became very opposed to slavery. And they chose to leave the South because of it. And when they started speaking out publicly about it in the North, it attracted a huge amount of attention. Of course, Southern slaveholders were furious. Uh, the sisters were told they could never come back. But the abolitionists were also furious with them. Um, and Weld was a minister, a courageous anti-slavery hero who was often mobbed. And so he takes it upon himself to write to Angelina and express those concerns. So this is the beginning of their relationship letter they became married. So Richard, read to us, please, from uh, Theodore Weld's letter. Okay. There is no reason why women should not make laws, administer justice, sit in the chair of state, plead at the bar and the pulpit if she has the qualifications, just as much as though she belonged to the other sex. I do most deeply regret that you have begun a series of articles in the papers on the rights of women. You are, a, you are Southerners, have been slaveholders. You can do more at convincing the North than 20 Northern females, though they speak as well as you. Now, this peculiar advantage you lose the moment you take another subject. You come down from your vantage ground. Let us all first wake up the nation to lift millions of slaves of both sexes from the dust and turn them into men. And then, when we, have all, when we all have our hand in, it will be an easy matter to make millions of females from their knees and set them on their feet, or in other words, transform them from babies into women. And Angelina answers, we are gravely told that we are out of our sphere even when we circulate petitions. We are out of our appropriate sphere when we speak to women only, and out of them when we sing in the churches. Silence is our province. We cannot push abolitionism forward with all our might until we take up the stumbling block out of the road. How can we expect to be able to hold meetings much longer when people are so diligently taught to despise us for thus stepping out of the sphere of woman? I fully believe that so far from keeping different moral reformations entirely distinct, that no such attempt can ever be successful. They blend with each other like the colors of the rainbow. So well, why? We, already, we already have a comment here from Jennifer. She, she's mm -hmm. writing here, uh, sort of summarizing this little section of our, of our presentation. Uh, what she said was that because of all the new reform movements emerging from the Second Great Awakening, women wanted to be part of them, but they were not allowed. This showed them that they must earn rights in order to join the movements. This was a huge catapult. Is that fair to say, the Second Great Awakening, a huge catapult in what it showed women uh, by virtue of what Absolutely. we're seeing on the screen right now? Absolutely. I don't know how many of you are parents, but I always use the analogy that, uh, you know, you put a child in the playpen and they're sitting there very happily and then um, they are not 
you know, aware of their confines. And then some, they all, you know, throw a toy out or whatever, and then they start trying to get out. And then they discover this barrier. And I, I think that, that this was sort of a, what women's rights movement later on would call a consciousness raising experience. It makes you aware of the fact that you, that you don't have the right of free participation even in churches uh, once you do something which you're trying to, uh, to get out of that sphere. But these are very good questions that people are raising here. Uh, I see someone mentions about um, the Quakers and, uh, and their role, and uh, they, were, they played a very interesting role in this. And in fact, it was um, <clears throat> Sarah's initial encounter with a Quaker up in Philadelphia who gave her books about uh, anti-slavery literature that got them started. And the Quakers, uh, yes, they even got, I see you've been reading about the Grimke sisters, yes, that even the Quakers got impatient with them. And, and, and the Quakers were one of the few groups that allowed women um, to speak in churches. That's a very good point. So what is Angelina's argument? What is she saying? Oh. Okay. Angelina, what point is she making here? Let's have a little bit of discussion around that, and we can move on. Um, any, any relationship to uh, what uh, Abigail Adams was talking about earlier on? And can, we, can we draw any straight lines from Abigail to Angelina? Uh, all right. Uh, freedom is freedom, and you can't separate the movements. She is pushing further than Abigail, certainly, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's just, yeah I, I think your, your analogy to the playpen there is apt, Marjorie, because she's, um, you know, she's saying we, we, can't, we can't agitate on behalf of slaves if we ourselves are not free. Would that be fair to say? It would, and also that she sees these two um, movements, like uh, Laura Wakefield mentions, these are inseparable. Mm -hmm. And this, this is what I meant earlier when, unfortunately, we are soon to get to the point in which some people do separate these movements. But the, the overall value was human freedom of all people, all kinds of people, male and female, slave and free, all of them should be free. And um, that's the point that Angelina is making. It's something she believed in uh, passionately all through her life. Um, and if I, in the interest of time, I might not have time to say this, but after working very hard against slavery, then in the post-war period, uh, she and Sarah found out about some young mixed-race men in South Carolina with the last name Grimke and wrote to them, found out that they were the, sired by one of their brothers. And they invited them to come to the North and they put them through education and they became ministers and professors. Um, they, it was very unusual in that, in that time. Yes. Well, shall we move ahead then? Yes. So this constant barrage of criticism and discrimination eventually led women not just to speak out individually for women's rights, along with other reforms, but to start a women's rights movement. Um, this actually came about in part by a famous example of this discrimination when women delegates to the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London arrived in London only to be told that they are not allowed to attend the conference unless, of course, they were willing to sit in the balcony behind a curtain merely listening. So two of them, Elizabeth Cady Stanton there on her honeymoon, by the way, and Lucretia Mott decided that they were going to go back to the U.S. and call a women's rights convention. When they finally did so in 1848 at this Methodist chapel near Stanton's home in Seneca Falls, New York, they were delighted when over 300 people, including 40 men, responded to the call. And by the way, that is now a national park uh, uh, and a historic site where if you didn't live in Florida and were living a little closer, you could take your students for a field trip. The women and men at Seneca Falls demanded a wide range of changes in women's social, moral, legal, educational, and economic status. Because like Abigail Adams, they were saying husbands should not have unlimited power over their wives. Uh, some of you ask if these people were married. Well, most of them were married. Most of them had children. And a lot of them had very good husbands who were very supportive. But their point was 
no man should have the right to abuse their wives and deprive them of their rights. So those are not rights that anyone should have. Um, but note that the right to vote was not their initial focus. In fact, they regarded the resolution demanding the vote as the most extreme of all of the things they were considering. And Stanton's husband, Henry, who had political aspirations, actually left town when he found out that they planned to call for something so outrageous. They adopted the resolution calling for the vote only by a narrow margin at the insistence of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the famous abolitionist, former slave, lifelong advocate of women's rights, Frederick Douglass. This is an, an excerpt from that very famous Declaration of Sentiments, as they called it. And um, one of the things that, rather than, than read it, I just would suggest to you that you, you know, have your students examine that and also the whole list that you have uh, access to and, and should have your students read because it really documents all of the grievances that they saw around them and, and the list of things that they thought needed to be addressed as well as the vote. But just ask you this, they are of course beginning to try to persuade and to reform. So they do this carefully. What other important document in U.S. history is the Seneca Falls Declaration modeled after? How does it reflect the rhetoric of the American Revolution? Okay, take a look at that just very quickly. What, obviously, what do we see there? Where, where, what, what are they bouncing this off of? This way you can show your students continuities between ideas uh, that run deeply in American history. Okay. Oh, there we go. Declaration of Independence. Certainly, we <laughs> right. hold these truths to be self-evident. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that that powerful rhetoric resonates all through our history. Yeah. Okay. So soon after the Seneca Falls Convention, Stanton, Mott, and others at Seneca Falls were joined by some additional people who were, unfortunately for them, not there. Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone were two of them. And here you see an early picture of. Anthony, who emerged as the best known suffrage leader and of course uh, a, a few years ago actually was the first woman to make it on a coin um, in our national currency. She started, she was a teacher. She started her career teaching in Rochester and you will be interested to know was an early advocate for equal pay for teachers. Then she began campaigning for woman's suffrage, at, along with temperance and the anti-slavery movement. She uh, helped slaves on the Underground Railroad uh, during the Civil War, became one of the founders of an organization called the Women's Loyal League that pushed for a 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And then we'll be getting to these other aspects of her uh, life later on. But these suffrage pioneers in the period between 1848 and the Civil War started holding annual conventions at which they discussed the need for married women to be able to own their own property, including any wages earned, uh, worked for improved legal and inheritance laws, equal rights to education, for the right to enter the ministry, business law, and medicine, for, and interestingly, for equal standards of morality for men and women. Suffrage was only one of the many issues that were addressed in these meetings. But after the war, there was a shift in focus as women's rights leaders began to see suffrage as one of the most important, perhaps the most important, of all of their goals. They still worked for all kinds of changes for women, opportunities for education, employment, uh, inheritance, etc. But they came to believe that women must have the right to vote in order to gain these other reforms. And so during Reconstruction, they were extremely upset when they were sort of left out um, of two very important amendments to the U.S. Constitution that, as you know, uh, 14th and 15th Amendments protected the rights of citizens and stated that citizens could not be denied the right to vote on the basis of race. But the woman suffrage advocates were extremely upset that women were not 
not given the vote at the same time. Indeed, the 14th Amendment actually inserted the word male to the Constitution for the first time. And these women were saying, oh, my God, it's going to take forever for us to get that out. Um, so the 14th and 15th Amendments then did not call for universal suffrage for all, as the suffragists had hoped. So they felt betrayed and angry. And even their friends like Frederick Douglass were begging them to understand that had the framers attached this radical notion of woman suffrage to the proposal for black male suffrage, it would have been too much for the public to swallow at the time. And it is very unlikely that the amendment could have been ratified by enough states. It was, they said, the Negro's hour. And the woman's hour, they said, would soon come. So that, of course, took another 50 more years. And in the meantime, the suffragists began to quarrel with them, one another about what to do. And so in 1869, as you see on the screen, there was a schism in the ranks. Um, and two, they basically, they divided into two organizations over the fundamental issue of whether or not to support ratification of the 15th Amendment now that women were being left out. So you have two competing organizations. Uh, with very different approaches. The National Women's Suffrage Association was based in New York, headed by Stanton and Anthony, and it actively opposed the 15th Amendment. Nonetheless, when it was ratified anyway, they started calling for a, a 16th Amendment to enfranchise women. The NWSA was led exclusively by women, and they were more militant and demanding in tone. They were determined that women ought to be given the right at the federal level and right away. Now, the other organization was the American Woman Suffrage Association. Its headquarters was in Boston, and it was led by Lucy Stone with the aid of her husband, Henry Blackwell, and several other well-known women and men of the day, like Julia Ward Howe, who was the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who had been a white officer of a famous black regiment in the Civil War, Henry Ward Beecher, who was a famous minister, sort of the Billy Graham of his day, but also the younger brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who you know who she is. So the AWSA shared this dismay that Reconstruction Amendments extending the vote had left out women. But their view was, must support ratification anyway, knowing that the newly free slaves would need this vote in order to protect themselves in the post-war world. Uh, the American suffrage leaders believed that um, an additional federal amendment giving women the vote was not realistic or possible in the near future, and therefore set about trying to cultivate grassroots support throughout the nation. And so their goal was then not to be so much demanding as persuasive and to try to convince the public that woman suffrage was not a radical idea, but consistent with widely shared values and went about developing this grassroots support by forming organizations in all the states, lecturing, distributing literature, and basically trying to educate the public on this. Marjorie, we have, if I could just interrupt here for a moment, we have an interesting question, and I'd ask you to speculate on this for just a few seconds here. Um, would, do you think slaves would have gotten the right to vote when they did if the order had been in reverse, if the country had focused on women's women's suffrage first and then uh, former slaves, what do you think would have happened there had the, had the order been reversed? It's it's difficult <clears throat> to imagine the order being reversed because um, at the time of the Civil War, you know the the main thrust of these abolitionist points of view, as we were saying earlier, was on freeing the, the slaves. And it was, you know, a 
a small group of women within the larger anti-slavery movement who were worried about women's rights. And even they also were focused especially on freeing the slaves. And um, what I do think is that Frederick Douglass and others who favored universal suffrage but insisted at this time that this was the Negro's hour, I think that they are quite right that at that time, women's suffrage was considered to be so shocking that they probably could not have gotten them both at the same time. That's an un uh, uh, unfortunate historical reality. Um, you may, as teachers, you, you probably uh, remember that that they had a lot of trouble getting the 14th and 15th Amendments ratified. And they were in serious doubt of whether or not they would get the three-fourths of the states that were necessary. There was a lot of, of uh, racial prejudice even in the North. And there were a lot of people who were against slavery but still didn't want to go so far as to enfranchise African Americans. So it was a tough call for people like when, um, Frederick Douglass who believed passionately in women's rights. But I, I, I think that they were probably right that they could not have gotten it at the time. So the vote for, for women was even more shocking and more radical idea, an idea than the vote for former slaves. Yes. Okay. All right, good. Well, shall we move on then to uh, Susan B. Anthony's speech? Yes. Well, Anthony and Stanton did definitely did not take well what the things we were just talking about. And they were very outraged that uh, they were now going to have to go all over the country begging for rights that they thought should already be theirs as citizens. And so in the 1870s, when they were not getting very far in trying to get another federal amendment for women's suffrage, they took what they called a new departure. And that meant efforts in which they tried to vote in defiance of the law. The idea was to become arrested and then tried in state courts where they were likely to lose and maybe be able to take their case all the way to the federal courts. And hundreds of women turned up on election days attempting to vote. And this was a bold and brave militant strategy. It was later known as civil disobedience, meaning knowingly disobeying a law to draw attention to its injustice. And as you all know, this was later uh, an important part of other drives for justice, uh, from Mahatma Gandhi's movement in India to Martin Luther King's in the civil rights movement of the 60s. But uh, you see it here um, even then. And, and so it ends up leading to, as you see on the screen, a rather famous or infamous trial that made a mockery of the judicial system. And that was the trial of Susan B. Anthony, which is, um, he has a very teachable moment and something that you might want to, to discuss in depth with your students. So what happened was that Anthony, in 1872, convinced a local polling place official to accept her ballot. Again, hoping to be arrested to become the test case for this strategy. She was tried locally in a trial where the judge, jury, and lawyers were all male, as women were not allowed to be any of these and Anthony was not allowed to speak in her own defense until it was over. She was found guilty by a judge, Ward Hunt, who brought his written pre-prepared decision with him on the first day of the trial and directed the jury to find her guilty. She was fined a hundred bucks, she insisted she would never pay a dollar of it, and she appealed the case to a higher court. Unfortunately, her her hopes of getting it before the Supreme Court were dashed when a well-wisher, thinking it was terrible for a woman to actually be placed in jail, paid the fine for her. So what you see here in this speech was when asked at the end if the prisoner had any remarks, Anthony sees the chance to give this speech, which, by the way, is a great one for students to memorize if you have them memorize famous speeches. And uh, there are also scripts out there that one can obtain for use in schools to have plays of, about this trial. Um, Richard, can you please read that, um, read from this excerpt from Susan B. Anthony's speech? 
Okay. Uh, fellow people in this here world, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election without having a lawful right to vote. It shall be my work this evening to prove to you that me thus voting, I not only committed no crime, but instead simply exercised my citizens' rights guaranteed to me and all United States citizens by the national constitution beyond the power of any state to deny. It was we the people, not we the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we the whole people who formed the union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people women as well as men. And it is a downright bad thing to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, the ballot. So any comments or questions about this? About why was she being tried? What was her defense? Any comments here? This would be another another good text. She makes a strong argument, pretty tough to argue. Yeah, it's inspiring. Yeah, I think this would work well with students. Excellent point. Who is yeah yeah who is a citizen? That's something that at this time in our, our history was uh, uh, debated. Question: We the people? Yeah, she is the people. Yeah, she's expanding yeah. that definition of the people. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, to just add another uh, note to this. It finally did get to the Supreme Court just a few years later. Uh, not Anthony, but Virginia Minor, a suffrage leader in Missouri, uh, when a registrar refused to um, register her. And uh, it's uh, the Missouri local courts uh, denied it on the basis that she didn't have that right. And so she did succeed in getting it um, before the court. And ultimately, what happened was that the um, the court ruled unanimously that citizenship did not automatically confer the right to vote. And for women, the issue was going to have to be decided state by state. So, um, so I don't know whether or not the suffragists realized just what a blow that decision really was. Because what that meant was that women were not going to get the right to vote soon after the Civil War, either through a federal amendment or through appeal to the federal courts. That this was going to be a long, slow slog, that there was not going to be a quick fix. Um, and it would take many more years. So after um, this decision in my, in um, 1875, it meant that they were going to have to do quite a lot of work. And if you look at the screen here, 56 campaigns of referenda to male voters, where the male voters would vote the question up or down, 480 campaigns to urge legislators to submit suffrage amendments to voters, 47 campaigns to induce state constitutional Constitutional conventions to write women's suffrage into state constitutions, 277 campaigns to persuade state party conventions to include them. In other words, they tried everything, uh, including continuing to get it from uh, Congress. And um, they made um, some progress, but it was slow. And interestingly, the first victories came in the West. To everyone's surprise, this wild and woolly West then being settled, um, out there politicians in several Western states not only enfranchised women, but at times actually battled with Congress for the right to do so. Wyoming led the way, as they are, and they're very, very proud of that out there. While they were still a territory, they led the nation in the adoption of women's suffrage that leading men of the territory were inspired by a tough pioneer woman named Esther Morris, who had attended some of those pre-Civil War suffrage conventions back east. And by the way, her statue is in the statuary hall of the U.S. Capitol uh, because of this. And so they enfranchised women. And then in 1890, when it looked as though Congress was not going to approve the 
Wyoming's application for statehood as long as it allowed woman's suffrage, the Wyoming legislature declared, quote, we will remain out of the union a hundred years rather than come in without the women. And then even more surprising to Easterners was that the Mormon stronghold, the territory of Utah, and was also among the very first parts of the U.S. to grant woman suffrage. Uh, Utah was, as a territory, was still under the control of Congress, and it was seeking to become a state. And so it was battling with the Congress for the right to keep polygamy, plural marriage. And yet, even while they had polygamy, they adopted woman suffrage. So it surprised many people. Uh, it did have to give up polygamy, but it was allowed to come into the Union with woman suffrage in 1896. And then, as you see, there were two more uh, Western states that adopted woman suffrage during the uh, 19th century, and then there would be no more until 1910. And then all of those, as this started up again, would come from the West. So why did the West lead the way, do you think? Well, there's the answer on the screen. <laughs> so, you know, what practical advantages do you think that there were for their states and territories in enfranchising woman suffrage? Um, there is such a thing that historians talk about all the time as the expediency argument, uh, meaning that it would be expedient to enfranchise women for certain practical political gains. And so in this case, um, what are they learning about the need for expediency arguments in addition to arguments based on natural rights and justice? Okay. What do you think the uh, progress in the West indicates about their strategy here? We got some interesting questions and answers. They wanted to attract women because there were not many women out there and the men wanted wives. Women are working side by side with men, and uh, Veronica writes, we do everything. So that's one, one good reason <laughs> yeah. to have women in the West. Yeah. In answer to the expediency question, we're not getting much of a response on that. I think probably they learned that they're going to have to make, you know, real expedient arguments. They're going to have to come down from the, the ether of uh, speaking of uh, rights and uh, talk about, listen, there are good, solid, expedient, practical reasons for giving women the vote. Is that fair to say? Yes, and that was, and what they learned from this was that um, the West was doing this for practical reasons. That they, in Wyoming, again, they thought it would be everything from an effective marketing gimmick that would put them on the map. Uh, you may not realize it, but when Wyoming gave women the right to vote, they were not only the first in the United States, but aside, I think, from the Pitcairn Islands, which were out in the middle of the Pacific somewhere, I believe they were the first in the whole world. And so this is really a big deal, and it certainly did attract a lot of attention. And again, they were trying to get women to come out there, including single women who um, couldn't find husbands because of the many casualties of the Civil War. But there was something else, and this is something that's gotten a lot of attention. This idea that was so widespread that Women and men were very different, but that women were more pious and religious and cultivated than men. That if they could get women out west, it would kind of help tame the place, you know, civilize the place. And that they would insist that there would be schools and churches built. And of course, that then they would bear children and build the population. But what about Utah? What practical reason did the men in Utah have for enfranchising women? What was that practical reason, do you think? Well, I think uh, more wives, yeah, okay. Teachers, yeah. Uh, at this time, I mean, uh, wasn't the biggest stumbling block for Utah's entry into the union the issue of polygamy? And weren't they trying here to, to avoid that here? They were yeah, trying to avoid having to give it up. Mm -hmm. so right, right. Give right. women the right to vote. Yeah. Uh, especially when, when you're way ahead of the rest of the country, that sort of makes it look like you're not um, being so 
hard on women. But the other thing had to do with who was out in Utah, okay? You have Mormons who have come out there in family groups, obviously have women with them. Who else is out there? You've got miners, cowboys, prospectors, uh, railroad construction workers who uh, were such rough and tough characters that locals sometimes refer to them as hell on wheels when they came in on those car cars to build the roads. And all of them tended not to have women with them. So the Mormons had women with them. The non-Mormons did not. And uh, you, you sort of double your power if you have women uh, voting. So I, I see some people are, are making comments about the fact that you know women out in the West were also working alongside with men and, uh, and or that the institutions were new and therefore you're starting fresh. And all of those I think did play a, rolling, a role in this. But generally speaking, historians and the suffragists at the time came away going, okay, we'll keep on using natural rights and justice arguments, but it looks like that if we're really going to make some progress in the states, that we're gonna to have to convince those politicians that there were good reasons that would help them if, yes. Um, now here is a major uh, step forward uh, that also picked up the spirits of the suffragists. Uh, when their movement attracted a very valuable ally, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, was at that time a new but enormously popular and influential organization that was spreading all over the United States and around the world. In fact, it had the largest number of members of any involuntary or uh, voluntary organization in the world, uh, over you know, hundreds of thousands of members, chapters across the globe, and a very much admired leader, Francis Willard, who uh, at one time was a dean at uh, Northwestern University in Evanston. Um, and so she made some arguments here that uh, I'd like you to take a look at and see um, what are the arguments she's making. What were the women like that she was working with and why did this endorsement, why might it be so important? Hey, what do you think? Why uh, why would the endorsement of the WCTU really give some impetus to the movement? Uh, let's see. If we give women the vote, there goes my right to have a drink. <laughs> it's one of the biggest women's organizations ever. That's true. That's true. I, uh, Marjorie, it would be fair to say that this was called Falling upon the uh, women's role as the protector of virtue, the the woman in the home, uh, um, you know, protecting the home from uh, the depredations of alcohol, and of course, alcohol and alcoholism at this time in the country was a very serious problem. That's right. And why, uh, uh, those of you participating, why do you think that alcohol was uh, abuse? which, as Richard said, was very, very widespread and uh, it was totally unrestricted then. Why were women particularly so upset about this widespread problem of alcoholism? Okay, why do you think that? Uh, all right, men, uh, let's see, men, <clears throat> women suffered much more from their husband's use of alcohol. Um, let's yep. see, men were the wage earners. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, yeah These if are you, good answers here. Yeah, yeah, the women had no protection at this time. I mean, domestic abuse laws were unheard of. I mean, the whole concept of domestic abuse probably didn't even exist. Would that be fair to say, Marjorie? Well, if you look no back to the, if if you look back to that Seneca Falls Declaration, which I really hope you'll carefully study, you'll see that one of the things that they were complaining about was that the husbands had the right to physically chastise, quote unquote, their Wives, and in fact, one of the, that rule of thumb that we hear about that dates back to the idea that it's okay for the husband to beat the wife as long as the stick he beats her with was no thicker than the judge's thumb. Um, yes, this is what Abigail Adams was worried about: was you know that husbands have this power to ab abuse their wives with impunity, and so what they're saying is they have no protections from it, and that 
um, if and that they were they were all aware that use of alcohol often made their husbands more violent. And several of you are mentioning that also that by spending the money on the alcohol, there goes the, the food budget, there goes the home budget. Um, Peter, you're mentioning that men drank the pay instead of spending on the um, family. So yes, so you can see why all of why this was such a big deal to women. And the other thing is, okay, who have we been looking at so far as the constituency of the women's suffrage movement? We've been looking at women from the Northeast, uh, women who were came out of a radical movement, the anti-slavery movement. Now you have an organization that has a constituency all over the country, and they are very definitely not radicals. What what difference does that make then? Oh, so now you are enlisting the help of um, average women, homemakers, uh, women who not had had not well, women who had not been political at all before because they couldn't yeah. be fair. Okay. Exactly, oh, very, and very. women who were might ha not have decided to buck public opinion and try to have a pu public role, let alone such a radical thing as we've got. In it, we accidentally got advanced here. Um, th this was this endorsement was so valuable because it brought in all of these Christian women, conservative women in all parts of the country, including the South, and they needed to expand their base way beyond the Northeast and to make it less radical. Um, I'd like to ask you to all of you to take your, uh, to take a look at the screen where it is, there's highlighting in red. Let the great guns of influence now pointing into vacancy, be swung to the level of benignant, that means uh, good use, and pointed on election day straight into the faces of the foe. So, and she's saying, critics would say, no, she should just train her son to vote right. But then Willard says, but if she could go along with him and thus make one vote too, should we then have a superfluous majority in a struggle intense as this one is going to be? So what is she saying about indirect influence? And what would she say to people like John Adams who had said, oh, you were the, you're the real power uh, behind the throne. You don't need the vote because you can already tell us what to do. How is Willard here taking on that argument that women really didn't need the vote because they could persuade men? Mm -hmm. uh, women, women's vote will lead to change in society. Yeah, I think they're they're. You know, Laura's right. They're rejecting that indirect influence uh, argument. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Well, yeah, but th that hand probably needs to be on a on a voting lever as well. Let me put in a plug here. We have an America in class lesson called uh, "Women's uh, the Cult of Domesticity and the Temperance Movement," which goes into this in uh, great detail. So if you want to take a look at that, it also calls upon the Ken Burns film uh, "Prohibition." Uh, so shall we move on? I think this is an excellent point, Marjorie. We've got about 30 minutes left. All right. Um, so we're taking away then. There, this is expanding the constituency and also. You are create, you're having a valuable ally, but you're also creating a new and powerful enemy for the woman suffrage cause. Who might that be? Okay, who who would oppose the WCTU? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think and not just I think, the average drinker. No, uh, not just the average drinker. Who really but, stood to lose if they shut down all of the well, saloons? <laughs> And that yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, bar keepers, exactly. beverage bar makers. And, and, and yeah. you talk about serious money. Uh, the liquor industry, or what they called the whiskey interests back then, they were a very serious uh, enemy. And Carrie Chapman Catt, the victorious president later on, as we'll see, um, she said, this, they become the invisible enemy whose bribery and uh, willingness to resort to all kinds of things in order to uh, keep women from voting, in order to keep 
to protect their uh, industry uh, became very important. Okay, so in 1890, we reach a very important juncture, and that is when these two warring organizations put aside the differences and merge their organization into one powerful association led by Susan B. Anthony. Um, that they all agreed that the ultimate goal of the NAWSA, better known simply as the National, was to get a federal suffrage amendment, but that they must first build support state by state. So they came up with a new combined strategy that was going in three decades to finally result in a victory for their movement. And if you look in red, basically that strategy was very simple. Enfranchise enough women through state suffrage amendments that Congress would eventually have to approve a federal amendment and then that three-fourths of the states would be sure to ratify. So um, that meant that they were going to go further in terms of shedding a radical image and avoid association with radical causes in the future, retaining the goal of a federal amendment, but recognizing that you've got to go about winning battles state by state before you can get back to the point where it is likely you're going to get a federal amendment. So I hope that is very clear because this is going to dominate everything we say for the, for the rest of the time. But I think one thing that when you're teaching this to your students, it's an, a good opportunity to talk to them about how the Constitution is amended and that the Founding Fathers wanting, wanted to make it very difficult to change the Constitution, to add anything to it. And um, so they set up those barriers, those high barriers that anything would have to overcome. Two-thirds of Congress had to approve it and then three-fourths of the state. So that leads to this discussion question at the bottom. Why is it that no amendment that is perceived as radical can succeed and be added to the U.S. Constitution? Okay, anybody want to take a stab at that? A few quick answers here. We've got to move ahead. But uh, why do you think no amendment that's perceived as radical can be succeeded? Can, excuse me, can succeed. See, it would be interesting. Um, popular support. Okay, yeah, yeah. You'd have to go out and sell this legislature by legislature, and uh, it would spread spread across the state. You'd have all sorts of different political uh, stances uh, coming into play, and probably something on the extreme wouldn't work. Would that be fair to say, Marjorie? That, that, I mean, just the, the reason that that no amendment that is thought of as radical could succeed is because that is exactly what the Founding Fathers intended. They, they don't want anything that doesn't have really, really broad support to ever be added to the U.S. Constitution. I want to make it really hard to do. Okay, so unfortunately, this leads us uh, back to the question of uh, racism and the relationships between the women's movement and the movement for the rights of African Americans. And some of you asked in the focus questions to, to, that for us to look at this question. What's the relationship between these two very important movements? So uh, as you may remember, in the 1890s, white Southern politicians were still very upset that the 14th and 15th Amendment had uh, given blacks men the right to vote. They were trying to restore white supremacy in politics. And Southern suffragists saw an expediency argument that they could use. And in fact, it was just as much national leaders as well as the Southern suffragists who, who tried this strategy, suggesting that Southern states adopt women's suffrage with restrictions, meaning either literacy or property requirements, that would in effect exclude most black women. And they argued that denying black men their right to vote would be a violation of the 15th Amendment and that the federal government might not allow that. However, Southern politicians, it turns out, were so strongly opposed to women voting that they were willing to take the chance. And so between 1890 and 1903, nearly every Southern state 
adopted voter requirements, including poll taxes, understanding clauses, et cetera, that virtually disfranchised blacks. And this and Congress looked the other way, as did the Supreme Court. And so as a result, for most of the 20th century, uh, large numbers of, of eligible African Americans in the southern states were not allowed to vote. In Mississippi, as late as the 1960s, only 8% of the eligible blacks in the state, in terms of voting age, were being allowed to vote. And the Congress finally brought this to an end in 1965 through the Civil Rights Act that keeps being extended and extended since then uh, to keep these problems from coming back up. Um, still an important political issue. So, but in this moment between 1890 and 1903, when there was this big drive to dis to restore white supremacy, these suffragists in the South and some national leaders, I hate to say, uh, went along with it. And um, it kind of reminds you of what happened after the Civil War when thing, the political situation was reversed and there was strong support for blacks to get the right to vote. Well, at this point, there is very strong support for having the vote taken away from blacks. And as these white suffragists in the South were trying to get the vote for themselves, they were saying that, let's seize this expediency argument and, um, and exploit that issue. So first of all, why did it matter to the national leaders that they had to bring in this part of the nation? Why did they have to bring in the South? Okay, why was that important? You think in terms of what they're trying to do now. Uh, like, uh, let's see, why do you think that was, any, any takers out there on that one? Well, clearly they needed, I mean, we're, we're ratifying, uh, trying to get a, uh, a constitutional amendment here, and it's going to be state by state, so would it be fair to say, Marjorie, that we needed, yeah, you needed the state legislatures. Is that, that's right. Is that what we're, yeah, yeah. That's right. First of all, in Congress, you're going to need some votes from the, from the uh, Southern representatives and Congress to get that two-thirds in the, in the federal level, and then it's going to be sent to the states. And if you have uh, all of your support is in the North and the West, and you have no Southern states, you're in trouble, and that, which, as we will see, turned out to be a real problem. And let me just add on this next slide that it was that there, this was also a period in which um, there was uh, widespread nativism, as that was also. Uh, a big problem. So yeah. here the, the movement is, is using the expediency argument. It is calling upon a white supremacist argument and an anti-immigration argument at this point. Yes. And okay. the point being that in this particular period in time, it was expedient for them right. to use these two arguments. And I'd like to sadly call attention to the second quotation there on the screen. Um, from Ella Chamberlain, who was the founder of the Florida Woman Suffrage Association, who back in the 1890s was making this argument. Now, I'd like also to point out that, you know, by the time the woman suffrage movement really geared up again in from 1910 to 1920, this woman was gone. She was not the leader. She had moved to another state. But these kinds of sentiments were very widespread, particularly in the 1890s. Okay. Well, shall we move on then? Our time is winding down. Okay. So, um, between 1896 and 1910, you have this interim period where um, the victories have been there in the West. They've tried these. They're trying these techniques in the South that are not working. Um, they're not getting any victories in any of the states. And a lot of historians have referred to these over the years as the doldrums for a woman's suffrage. But uh, Sally Hunter Graham and other historians have, have found, noted recently that no, this was actually a rebuilding period and one in which they were uh, working to uh, 
um, under the leadership of Carrie Chapman Cap, uh, who succeeded Anthony. And then after she had to step down when her husband became ill, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, whom you see on the right, um, these were the leaders during this period. Um, Anna Howard Shaw, by the way, was one of that first generation of college-educated women in the United States who became not only a ordained minister among Methodists, but also a licensed medical doctor. She's a very smart woman. So they went about promoting an image of the movement as respectable and mainstream and attracted many new supporters. They set out to recruit, for one thing, socially prominent, influential women, uh, many of whom helped fund the suffrage campaign. Uh, women like Alva Belmont uh, Vanderbilt, who you know, was, really did a lot to, to raise the funds and personally. And this also helped, as well as financing the movement, to help them shed an image of radicalism. They also reached out to a new generation of women, many of them college educated, who brought in fresh ideas and tactics, including parades and public speeches, you know, totally leaving behind that idea that you're not supposed to speak in public and just getting out there in, in a new climate, a new era, and doing that. Also appealing to women workers, saying, you know, you are running into all kinds of hazards at work, you are running into low pay, get the vote to represent yourself and your interest. Uh, also, again, as teachers, they really worked on schools, uh, distributing literature to schools, sponsoring debates and essay contests designed to, to create more support. And finally, they reached out to growing numbers of women active in women's clubs, including those promoting the goals of the new progressive movement that was so hot among the middle class. The woman, so the progressive movement turns out to be uh, extremely important. It is this, again, you're t I'm talking to teachers, you know this already, so I'll go very quickly. This was a reform movement, um, particularly strong with the middle class, begins in the states and communities uh, in the 1890s or 1900, and spreads to the national level. It influences both the Republican and the Democratic parties. We associate both Republican Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, uh, the Democrat, with it. Key goals, seeks to rid government of corruption and improve society. Puts a high value on professional expertise, science, and efficiency, and to improve society through the application of knowledge and experts. They were really big on promoting pure food and drug legislation, what we now call consumer protection, also to regulate business uh, and to protect workers, including doing something about a very big problem, which was child labor. They also were trying to Americanize immigrants, prepare them to, uh, to share a widespread American ideals, uh, become good citizens, and woman suffrage was one of their key goals. In fact, the progressive movement gave suffragists a new and far more positive than what we've just been talking about, as well as effective argument for woman suffrage as politically expediency. The idea there is that if women had more than indirect influence, their support for progressive reform would carry a lot more weight. And you see here, this is an example of the kind of literature that they um, were that they were using. Uh, Richard, can you just give us a, a little bit from the top uh, and the bottom of this poster? Um, this would be a really good one for you to have your students analyze. You know, how did how did they? Uh, if you look at this poster, how did they make use of current ideas about? woman's place to argue that she should have a new place, which was in the ballot box. Okay, that is, it really is an interesting argument. Let's take a look at it. The place of women is in the home, but merely to say in the home is not enough. She must care for the health and welfare, moral as well as physical of her family. She is responsible for the cleanliness of the house, 
She is responsible for the wholesomeness of the food. She is responsible for the children's health. She is responsible, above all, for their morals. And then moving down to the bottom, unclean houses, defective sewage, unwholesome food, fire risk, dangers of infection, moral influence on the streets. If women are responsible for the results. Let them have something to say as to what the condition shall be. There is one simple way to do this. Give them the vote. So women's places in the home, let's take that, that, those same skills and that same moral attitude and move it into the streets. Right, Marjorie? Exactly. And, and I think that all of you will find this kind of shocking in a way because we assume that the women's movement has also been always been to get rid of the idea of the separate sphere. And, and in many cases, they were. But what these people are saying is, okay, we don't have to totally throw out all of our ideas about uh, the diff women's innate differences between men or their different responsibilities in society. When they're trying to reach out to the broadest possible audience, they're trying to say, okay, let's not argue this question about whether or not there's a woman's sphere. Let's just say that if she's going to have these responsibilities in this new era, when these issues about sewage and food and fire and immoral influence on the streets are being controlled by government, then it's important that women be part of that government, that they clean up politics. So in, if you look at that second question, I think this is one of the most important things about the whole suffrage victory. Um, how do their arguments reflect progressive ideas about woman's nature and role and about new ideas about what government should do? And I would just say, consider this, that in the end, the progressive movement was a huge help to woman's suffrage because without even changing ideas about woman's nature, and role without even attacking that, you still can argue that they have a very important role to play in politics because during the progressive movement, Americans in general adopted new ideas about what government should do. So if you want the government to protect you from horrible sausage with rats in it. If you've read The Jungle, you know what I'm talking about, Upton Sinclair's highly teachable book, The Jungle. If you want there to be changes, including temperance, prohibition, then you would want women to have the vote so that they could use it. Okay. I would like to also point out that even though some women, particularly in the 1890s, were really exploiting that the racist strategies that after that when it, things kind of kind of changed uh, a lot of the racism was being injected into the movement from the conservatives the opponents of women's suffrage instead and you have uh, the, a lot of african-american women actively supporting women's suffrage using both justice and expediency arguments um, on the left you see adela hunt logan who was a faculty member at Tuskegee and the wife of the university's treasurer, um, and who nevertheless lived next door to Booker T. Washington, but wrote articles in W.B. Du Bois' The Crisis supporting women's suffrage. And then Mary Church uh, on the right, uh, who was a very wealthy and prominent African-American club woman, um, who both of them argued that if white women needed the vote to protect their families, black women needed it even more. Then in the center, you see the famous Ida Wells Barnett, uh, who was a leading crusader against lynching and a major advocate for women's suffrage, who wanted the power of black women's votes to be used for social justice. And in the cartoon at the right, this is taken from the crisis. And W.E.B. Du Bois was a major supporter of women's suffrage, and he hoped that black women uh, could help overturn Jim Crow laws and other racist legislation. I, I'm wanting you to understand that when we're talking about the relationship between the women's suffrage movement and the movement for civil rights for African Americans, that there are times when these things verge and are very much apart, but there are also times 
when they are together, and that black women uh, were big supporters of the women's suffrage movement um, from the 1840s all the way up through this period. Okay. Um, now we want to focus on the last few years. We're, you know, we've noted already that from 1910 forward, all of a sudden, as a result of the progressive movement and this idea that women would vote to support progressive reforms, um, you start having real progress being made beginning on the West with uh, you know, Western states and sort of creeping back toward the East. And that really encouraged um, the suffragists. And, um, by 1916, when Woodrow Wilson is up for re-election, uh, woman suffrage was a huge issue in American politics. Uh, President Theodore Roosevelt had endorsed it strongly. President Wilson and the Democratic Party was also strongly in favor of progressive reform. And as a result, many Democrats favored woman suffrage. But there was a big problem about a big dispute about the method by which women should receive the vote. The Democratic Party back then was strongly pro-states' rights. So President Wilson and his party, even when they finally came out for woman suffrage as a concept in 1916, would only support giving women the right to vote through state action. And it made, but it still, as he goes in 1916 to address the woman suffrage convention, it made the president very nervous to oppose woman suffrage right before the election. Because, as you recall, by this time out in the West, there are a whole lot of women who are going to be voting in that election. And so if you look at this, how is he trying to hedge his bets? How is he trying to avoid taking a stand in this speech to the National Suffrage Convention right before the 1916 election. How is he trying to uh, hedge that here? See, we feel the tide, we rejoice the strength of it, we shall not quarrel in the long run as to the method of it. Uh, seems like he's saying here that you know that the tide's going to come in no matter what we do, just just wait, it's inevitable. Is that, is that an accurate characterization? And yes, and he's saying, so let's uh, let's not push the issue here. Uh, please, I'm with you, wink, wink, nod, nod. But uh, at the moment, he didn't feel like he could afford to endorse the federal amendment because his party uh, did not. Okay, so he is saying it's going to calm, be patient, uh, but uh, and in the end, we won't quarrel about the method, but at the moment he was not going to endorse the federal amendment. Okay, so in the last few years of the suffrage movement, uh, um, as they start to move back from and put more emphasis on winning that federal amendment, there was another schism. Again, not over the goal of the movement, but over strategy. Uh, it was also, again, about attitude. Uh, militancy versus moderation and pragmatism. Uh, what you have here is in um, 1910, this highly educated young Quaker woman, Alice Paul, returned from the, to the United States where she had seen the militant suffragists in England at work. And she comes back and demands that the national organization in the United States quit going state by state begging for support and just focus on that federal amendment. In other words, she kind of admires the militant spirit of Anthony and them in the 1870s. And um, she says, let's just demand it. Let's take it. Let's. And so um, she um, comes up for, uh, with several different strategies that are really offensive to Carrie Chapman Catt into the national, the much larger, older organization. Uh, first of all, and this is a little technical, but she splits with the national, which is nonpartisan, over a plan that she brought back from England to oppose the Democrats as the party in power uh, until they would commit to support the federal amendment. So she 
creates something called the National Woman's Party in 1916, which includes all of those women throughout the country who already have the vote. And she urges all of them to oppose Wilson's reelection. <clears throat> and during World War I, the National Women's Party actually pickets the White House and they burned Wilson's speeches. And we'll get more to that in a minute. On the other hand of this new split, you have Carrie Chapman Catt. Uh, she had been president of the National after Anthony earlier and again had to quit when her husband became ill. So she returned to the presidency in 1915. Huge movement because she is so capable. She replaces Dr. Shaw, who had been this great orator but a terrible organizer, who only had this loosely coordinated campaign in the state. So Kat introduces at that same convention where Woodrow Wilson was speaking in 1916, her winning plan. She says, this is top secret, but we're going to hit them everywhere where we think we have a chance with a coordinated national suffrage campaign. We're going to focus on gaining enough states that Congress would have to approve the federal amendment. In other words, she is now seeing that the time has come when we are going to realize the results of that strategy that they adopted back in 1890. So the goal is to focus resources on the winnable states and to avoid losses, to avoid campaigns where they thought they would lose, in effect, riding off the South until the ratification states. She opposes Paul's militant tactics as radical and disadvantaged to the cause, uh, and she seeks to reason and persuade Wilson and other politicians. And interestingly, in terms of a <clears throat> pragmatism, Cad was a lifetime pacifist, but she put aside those beliefs during the war to urge suffragists to support the war. And she's angry when Paul and the National Women's Party picket the White House, even during wartime, which angered President Wilson and many Americans. And this is this is what you see happening. Militant suffragists uh, picketing the White House. Uh, Richard, can you read the, the sign? Sure. President Wilson is deceiving the world when he appears as the prophet of democracy. President Wilson has opposed those who demand democracy for this country. He is responsible for the disenfranchisement of millions of Americans. We in America know this. The world will find him out. Open words during war time. Yes. Really, uh, and, and so what was the slogan of, of Wilson in, as the U.S. had entered the war, we are going to make the world safe for democracy and restore self-rule. So what are they accusing Wilson of doing here? Yeah, well, safe for democracy. They, yeah, well, they accuse him of hypocrisy, clearly. Out, outright. Yeah. And so this is very important. They are trying to embarrass the president to make him uh, realize the contrast between his, all his lofty speeches and the fact that, you know, half of the people of the United States are not allowed self-government. And so that is what they are trying to do. Now, how did their strategy differ from that of Carrie Chapman Catt and the National? Okay. Well, I, I would say that it's it's uh, just for the we have to move on, but I would say that the, the difference really uh, is on the point of emphasis. I mean, Paul is trying to uh, galvanize a national sentiment, whereas Kat is saying that we're going to work state by state. So it's a different, diff they're saying, those are the same goal, making a lot of the right. same arguments, but they're doing it, you know, they're, they're applying mm -hmm. their points of emphasis in different places. We're, yes. Well, actually, Carrie Chapman, Kat is saying we're going to do everything. In fact, she had the, quote, do everything strategy. She's saying, yes, we're going to focus on the federal amendment, but we're also going to get it by wrapping up the number of states that we need. Now, whereas Paul is saying, let's ignore the states. Kat's saying, you can't ignore the states. We've still got to have some more in order to win. But they're definitely both working on the federal amendment, and one's trying to persuade while the other one's trying to demand. So uh, then we can't, we don't have time to linger here, but um, what you have here, uh, you know, just two years later, uh, the nation has been through the war. President Wilson addresses the Senate, and this time he gives his full support to the cause and even to the federal amendment 
and if you look there at that, uh, he, he, he says, we have made partners of the women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not of privilege and right? The war could not have been fought if it had not been the services of the women. Not, not merely in the fields of effort in which we've been accustomed to see them, but wherever men have worked and upon the very uh, skirts and edges of the battle. We shall not only be distrusted, but shall deserve to be distrusted if we do not enfranchise. So, in other words, uh, eventually, you know, Wilson gives in, becomes an active supporter of women's suffrage, even by federal amendment. And historians will debate forever and a day about the relative importance of the efforts of Paul and the militants versus Cat and the moderates in terms of bringing him around. But when he actually does come around, he doesn't say, oh, I was embarrassed by that, so i got to come around, or they finally talked me into it. It is, it is the war. It is the war that justifies this and the work that the women did during the war, and they deserve their full equality. It kind of reminds me, again, of after the Civil War, when black men fought in the Civil War and were afterwards said, you know, we have proven ourselves as men, as citizens, and we demand um, the vote. And many people believed that that was very persuasive and important. And here many people believe that women's support for the war effort uh, had shown that they ought to have this, this vote. Um, however, now finally Congress ratifies, and it turns to the state. And here again, suffragists face the problem they long feared they would, which is Southern opposition to, quote, another federal amendment. Then they, you see on the left that deadly parallel. There they, they cite the 15th Amendment and the, and the left, the 19th on the right, and they're saying it's the same thing. So what, why did these white Southerners oppose the federal amendment? And what historical memories does this poster call upon? Well, I think they were <clears throat> afraid that it would reopen the uh, the question of uh, African American suffrage and uh, upset the uh, the uh, white supremacist uh, balance that they had achieved at this point. Would that be would that be accurate? Yes, right on target. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned before, you know, a lot of them were very upset that there had been a 14th and 15th Amendment. You know, they said, hey, the Constitution originally gave it to the states. And even in 1875, the Supreme Court, with minor case, had suggested that. And so they're saying, you know, we went ahead and disfranchised and nobody has, has enforced the 15th, so let's not bring it up again. And they were also saying that no good son of the South or daughter of the South um, ought to be saying that the federal government has the right to say who should vote in the states. So th there was a lot of, um, of bitter opposition um, there. So um, by 1920, all of the southern states, of course, are controlled by Democrats. Um, most of those state legislatures opposed women's suffrage. So for the federal amendment to succeed, some southern states would have to come around. Uh, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Texas all ratified, but the rest refused up to this point. And so Wilson, with the 1920 presidential election coming up, he's wanting the Democrats to win. He's wanting the League of Nations to succeed. Um, he's wanting those women's votes. And um, also, Wilson was eager that a Democrat-controlled state gain credit for the suffrage victory. So, Wilson persuades the governor of Tennessee, a Democratic state, to call a special session for August 1920. Wilson persuades him to call a special session for August in order for ratification to be possible before the November 1920 election. So national becomes the battle royal, and suffragists from both both parts of the movement all come in. Um, all summer they spend the time lobbying, working for ratification. 
uh, anti-suffragists from across the country also converge on Tennessee, including lobbyists for the whiskey interest and other businesses such as the cotton textile mill industry that relies heavily on child labor and fears women votes. And um, there are all kinds of allegations flying about bribery and corruption. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it's one year after prohibition went into effect in 1918. So there's not supposed to be any liquor flowing, but it is all over that hotel where those legislatures were staying. Some very colorful stories. And um, many legislators who had expressed their commitment to women's suffrage mysteriously changed their minds. And in the interest of time, I will go on to the end. Finally, with the whole world watching, the vote appears to be tied. And then one young 24-year-old legislator, Harry Byrne, from the mountains, whose, whose district is opposed to women's suffrage. So he had already said that he was going to vote no. But now it's tied. And he suddenly changes his vote and votes for women's suffrage. Now, it takes everybody a heartbeat or two before they realize what has happened here. And then the suffragists in the gallery start to go crazy and singing, and bells and whistles are all over town. But the aunties are just furious. And they accuse Burton of having been bribed, which is ironic because they were bribing so many people. But he explains that he had gotten a letter from his mother that was in his pocket. And uh, so it's it says, dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stood, but have not noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification, your mother. And then you can see that Carrie Chapman Cat writes a telegram to the mother in the mountains, 82-year-old mother, and said, you are blessed with a brave and honest son. Whatever the enemies of justice and decency may do now to show their vengeance on him, he is bound to have a great future. You will ever be proud of him. So it's kind of ironic that in the end, women finally get direct influence and the vote as a result of the indirect influence of Harry Burns mother. But I think we all have to be grateful that uh, Fortunately, the indirect influence of his mother rather than the indirect influence of the liquor industry uh, prevailed. Well, and, and then you bring up the liquor industry. One of our participants uh, missed uh, your comments about the liquor industry's involvement in Tennessee. And I think if I remember correctly, you said that although the Tennessee vote happened during Prohibition and no liquor was supposed to be flowing, an awful lot of it was around uh, Nashville and the Tennessee State House. Uh, uh, and that, yeah. is, that summarizes what you said. Okay. And, well, ladies, and also, yes. you have to remember that the 18th Amendment had just so-called settled the issue with prohibition, but the liquor industry by no means regarded it settled, and they were working harder than ever to repeal it. So the last thing in the world they wanted was for women to get the vote, because then they thought they would never be able to get it repealed. Ah. So that became a very important is issue, and they did they took off the gloves and, and really went at it. Okay. So you, in the end, there's final victory. It is uh, ratified uh, uh, August 26, 1920. is now celebrated as uh, Women's Equality Day. And the fight was over, but what a fight it had been. Um, one thing I would urge you to, to tell your students that, I never miss a chance to tell them is never miss a chance to vote. Uh, too many people worked too hard and gave too much for them to stand by and not take advantage of that right and privilege. Okay, and we do have one last question here very quickly. What happened to Harry Burns? Well, um, Harry Burns went on to have a, um, a, a career, a few more years in the legislature, a businessman. Uh, he didn't go on to have um, to to continue to rise up the political ladder, but but uh, they didn't ruin his his career and his life either. Okay, he became, great. He definitely became a hero to the woman suffrage movement, whose whose name survives uh, in the column of good guys.
Good. Well, folks, we have come to the end of our session. I want to thank all of you for your participation this morning. And Marjorie, I want to thank you for giving us a wonderful seminar. I think we've all learned to I know in putting this together, I learned a great deal more about women's suffrage than I ever knew. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please use the forum to uh, continue the discussion and to share approaches. We'll monitor the forum until May 1st. Submit your evaluations. Don't forget those. We look forward to having them. Once again, I want to thank you and wish you all a good day. Bye-bye.